great crowd we've got tonight. And welcome to the uh, work session for the Board of Mayor and Aldermen for Tuesday, February the 12th, 2019. Our policy is if you plan on speaking on an issue, that you would bring me a speaker card that's located at the post, and I've already got some, and I don't take those all meeting. So I kind of give you that announcement to know that you need to get them to me now. So if at 623 you decide you want to speak, I'm not going to let you speak. Okay, and uh, the next item of business is our citizen comments for items that are not on the agenda, and I have no speaker cards, so we'll move on to uh, the Tree Commission report, and uh, Brandy Blanton is on the Tree Commission, and Brandy, give us the report. Actually, I've been chairman of the Tree Commission for eight years now, and I say that because this is the first time I had to do anything official in front of everyone. We're kind of an underground committee. <laughs> that was not even planned. It's a deep rooted so, committee. Actually. It is. <laughs> so um, I'm going to ask my fellow tree commission members to join me um, as they come up. Michael Johnson with Middle Tennessee Electric, Beth Adams and Justin Stelter. We also have Skip Hebert who can't be here tonight and also Kim Hoover who I do not see. And then also important to mention um, Scott Harrison has been a part of the tree commission actually longer than I have and um, he left us in December. But we're here tonight because our fearless leader also left us last fall. Todd, please come up here. So this is Todd Snackenberg. If you've ever seen a, a city video with a, a natural comic, this would have been him. Um, Todd um, was our city arborist actually for the last 10 years and he did a transition within our city family which we're glad to keep him. Don't you love how many people came here tonight for you? <laughs> um, and the, the Tree Commission, I'm sure it's probably confusing, what do we do? Um, we do meet at least quarterly and sometimes more often, but um, our big objectives, we help us get a distinction that's very important called Tree City USA, which we've gotten how many years in a row, Todd? Uh, 11. 11. So that's one of the little monikers you might see as you drive into the city limits. So, um, I can't say that we take the credit for that. Todd has done all of the heavy lifting, as well as organize Arbor Day, which is coming up again annually. annually. This year, I think our date is April 20th this year. But we could not let Todd leave our family without recognizing him. And we've literally been trying to do this for uh, three months now, I believe. So Todd and everyone, if you'll just come join me, I want to read this. Todd Snackenberg, in grateful appreciation for your 10 years of service to the City of Franklin as City Arborist, the Franklin Tree Commission, myself, Beth Adams, right here, Skip Hebert, who can't be here, Michael Johnson, Scott Harrison, who I mentioned, Kim Hoover, who's not here, and Justin Stelter. So please, please appreciate this man with us. We want to Thank get a you. commemorative a picture if we could. Thank you for putting us early on the agenda. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, we have our notebook. Kim's here. Oh, there's Kim. Yeah. Sure. And we, we really appreciate the service of the uh, volunteers on the uh, Tree Commission. And Brandy, we appreciate that you've been chairing this for eight years. Thank you. Okay, we're honored tonight to have a presentation of the 2018 vital signs by the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce, and we have Ralph Schultz with us. Ralph, you're welcome to sit with us, or do you like being up there at the podium? You want to sit? We'll all sit with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're friendly. This is probably a dead one. We'll deaden it if we need to. <laughs> If, if suddenly people can't hear you, that means, yeah. Yeah, your talk is over when the mic goes dead. <laughs> Real close, it's just like singing in a concert, huh? Um, well, thank you all for having us here. Amanda Short is here with me from our research center and she'll do most of the presentation. Just a couple of points I'd like to make. 
um, here at the beginning. First of all, the opportunity to visit with you about the vital signs findings and the research is really important because as public officials, you establish policy that determines whether this community can be a prosperous community or not. And every year we undertake research and a study to help identify those things that are both opportunities and challenges throughout this region. The Nashville Area Chamber is a regional chamber. We serve 14 counties. We work with partners like Williamson Inc., uh, Williamson County Government, Franklin Government, particularly on issues with regard to economic development. So it is very important for us to have this research um, available to us uh, as well as have it available to you. I do want to draw your attention to the fact that uh, we do have sponsors for this study and I want to recognize them as we start. Um, are you operating the clicker? No, okay. The ah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll give that to you. There, those, whoops. Well, our sponsors include Barge, First Bank, the Tennessean, uh, and the Greater Nashville Regional Council. Greater Nashville Regional, Nashville Regional Council is important because they particularly uh, provide data to us uh, as well. So again, thanks. We're going to flash through this information. Um, I want you to know that there are a couple of additional layers of information available to you anytime you would uh, like to pursue it. First of all, we've given you a copy of the book that we've printed with more data for you to look at. We also have more data available online at our site uh, at the Nashville Area Chamber site. And again, for you as public officials, anytime you have questions or anytime you would like to know additional information, we ask you that you call us so that we can provide that information to you. So at this point, I'll turn this over to Amanda and she'll take you through the information. regions, which is a pattern of decline and regrowth. So this begs the question, where is Nashville, the Nashville region currently? We are obviously growing, or as some may say, thriving. But this has not been accomplished alone. Growth like we have seen in the Nashville area requires both public and private partnerships, as well as collaboration across communities. Vital Signs covers data from both the Nashville and Clarksville MSAs, but today we're going to focus on one city, particularly in our MSA, Franklin. This year's Vital Signs is unique in that it takes a look at the past 10 years, um, so the last decade since the recession. As we reflect on the growth of our city, it is also important to look ahead at what's to come. This report is used by elected officials and business leaders to make important decisions affecting our region. This report covers trends of workforce and education, transportation and infrastructure, health and affordability. We will touch on each of these topics today. So let's start with the most obvious change over the past 10 years, population and, in and industry growth. Franklin individually has grown by 29% over the past decade to a 2017 population of just over 120,000. Looking forward to 2028, the population is expected to reach almost 150,000. With this increase in population, the economy has also prospered with GDP rising $3 million in just three years. With a stimulated economy and job openings skyrocketing, one major issue currently is workforce scarcity. Unemployment in the Nashville MSA reached 2.4% in December of 2018, while it was even lower in Franklin at 2.1%. The fastest growing occupations in the next 10 years are projected to be social sciences, legal occupations, healthcare, and community and social service occupations. Wages are also generally higher in Franklin than the MSA as a whole. Here, an individual can expect to make between $30,000 and $60,000 with a graduate degree, or a bachelor's degree respectively, and with a graduate or professional degree, almost $80,000. In terms of education, Franklin is above the national average of people with bachelor's and professional degrees. Educational attainment has a variety of implications for an individual. 
For example, a person with less than a high school diploma is less likely to be in the labor force and often cannot secure a job with a livable wage and thus lives in poverty. One key to helping fill the supply gap is to have an educated workforce that is well trained. Overall educational attainment of workers can also mask differences across races and ethnicities. This provides an opportunity to create a more diverse workforce. Higher education institutions and employers must continue to work together to bridge these gaps. Another component to the vital signs of our regions is infrastructure and transportation. While many have expressed support of improved transit, the May 2018 referendum in Davidson County was unsuccessful. Residents polled from all over Middle Tennessee showed their support with 77% saying it was important or very important for community leaders to try again to seek voter approval of a transit plan and funding. This is an important part of our future as a region. It is also important to note that just under 70% of Franklin residents commute outside of the city limits every day for work. This has natural implications for both the stability of the economy in Franklin moving forward, as well as traffic congestion in the area as a whole. A household is considered to be cost burdened if it spends 30% or more of its monthly income on housing or 20% or more of its monthly income on transportation. Right now, Franklin on average, in Franklin on average, individuals are spending 60% of their income on both housing and transportation. And even though incomes are increasing, residents still find it difficult to find housing within their budget. Median home prices in Franklin increased dramatically from 320,000 in 2012 to 413,000 in 2016, up almost 29%. Cities must ensure that residents working within the region can also afford to live in the region without needing to live further and commute a longer distance to work every day. I understand that Franklin is working on various initiatives to make this a reality. Finally, all of the issues that we just covered are ultimately affected by the health of the people in our region. The Nashville area is the healthcare industry capital of the world. However, healthcare offered by companies is on the decline. 68.5% of all businesses in the area provided health insurance in 2006, but now less than 50% of businesses do. It is important for community leaders to see the impact that all of these factors have on population health as a whole. Hopefully this quick overview of the Vital Signs 2018 has demonstrated that the issues addressed, workforce, mobility, affordability, and health are critical to the health of our businesses, our communities, and our region. Thank you. So Amanda, thank you. A uh, couple of quick things I'll just add very quickly about the region in general. Uh, right now, jobs are growing in this region at a rate of about 30, 30 to 40,000 a year, and the population is growing at about a 35,000 person rate. The last time we looked at the demographic statistics, we found that the average age of those people moving into this region is 29, and many of them, if not most of them, had a, a higher education degree, some form of certification or a degree beyond high school. In large measure, a lot of the job growth that you see occurring in this region is being fueled by that in-migration. We have continuing um, issues with the education pipeline broadly across the region and making sure that students in the pre-K-12 level and then students that are particularly entering that uh, the TCATs and the community colleges are being equipped with the proper skills to take advantage of the uh, of the economic t uh, opportunity that is uh, that is rising here. It's going to be important. That we just concluded a study with uh, with Brookings as we looked at the. Uh, workforce and the jobs that will be created between 20 now and 2035. Keep in mind that today's kindergarten students will be graduating and entering the workforce at 2035. And what we found was that 46 and a half percent of the jobs that exist in this region will be affected by automation and artificial intelligence. It doesn't mean that there will be less jobs, but it does mean that the jobs that exist today are at some level of risk by automation and artificial intelligence. So as we see workforce scarcity continuing for at least the next 20 years, 
it is important for this entire region to consider where the education system is equipping those students to be able to be productive members of the workforce and, uh, and participants in the education area in the economy by 2035. So, and this is a very recent report. It was just concluded within, within the last week. It's extremely detailed. <coughs> Again, if you wanted further data, we could tell you about job classification where we see those things uh, being affected. <coughs> One last point on that <coughs> issue. Um, if you're talking to your grandkids or your kids about where those future opportunities lie, um, more and more automation is being directed at even those processes that create the software and create the artificial intelligence uh, that helps drive some of these uh, repetitive tasks that they, that they fuel. The opportunity in the future is going to be mostly in interfaces, that is, how do you take those tools and turn them into practical use for human use and in categories like personal care, nursing, et cetera, where there is some level of human perception, human um, uh, perspective uh, required to uh, do the work. So I'll just sum up the vital signs. Generally, this region is in great shape. It needs to continue to be vigilant <coughs> about these emerging needs to maintain our, our prosperous growth. And when you look at education, infrastructure, and the health culture of this region, those for the, for the foreseeable future will be key elements in maintaining this prosperity going forward. And uh, Mayor Moore, one of the other numbers that I like to talk about with regards, you may have noted that 70% of the people from this area exit the area to go to work. 68% of the workforce that works in Williamson County every day comes from outside of Williamson County. So you've got 70% leaving and 68% uh, coming in. That's a pretty important dynamic to understand if you want to maintain business prosperity. Thank you. So Questions? Wh what does the 70 percent equate to? I mean, how, how many, many number? How many, wh how how many, many people? people? How In many terms people? of population? I'd have to get that. I can get that number to you. I don't have it okay. on hand. Because, I mean, <laughs> um, if you're saying that 70 percent is coming in, if there's 50,000 jobs in Franklin and there's 70 percent going out, there's not 50,000 people going out of Franklin on a on a daily basis going to Davidson County. Well, we can get you those numbers, okay. those that, population yeah, I think numbers. That that's yeah, the numbers we had from probably three or four years, well, probably four or five years ago mm -hmm. was somewhere around 28,000, that that may have been vehicle trips, uh -huh. and they were pretty closely balanced. And, and when you looked at the region yep. and the pairings of counties, Williamson and Davidson were the only ones that had an equal mm -hmm. balance going to and from. Everybody else was heavy into Davidson lighter back out, we were the only pairing that you saw a, a balance in. And well, that does <coughs> remain the case. <coughs> well, the reason I asked, not that, not uh, somewhat, somewhat related, but if you go to the interstate, the interstate's bumper to bumper. Mm -hmm. But they're not all Franklin people mm -hmm. going into Davidson County. Right. It's probably, I don't know I how many, I'd be afraid to even guess, but there's certainly not all Franklin people that are going into Davidson County. A lot of people from Franklin going to Cool Springs and other areas to work then, so. Uh. Yeah, for people who have an affordability issue in, the way in Williamson County, they're coming in for jobs that are those middle skill jobs and, and the lower skill jobs. Mostly middle skill though, I mean there's a high emphasis. that The job quality in this area is pretty strong. But they're coming in from Rutherford County, they're coming in from Davidson County, they're coming in from Murray County. And I, I don't want to—I don't want to pick at any one particular number, but Eric, is that is the population right on 27? No, that, that's not an accurate. It's not yeah, total it's about. Population. It's, it's around probably around the seventy thousand range. For probably Franklin around eighty. Proper, probably Franklin around eighty thousand now. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was the five-year estimate okay. from ACS. Okay. Go ahead, Alden. Um, your numbers on children without health insurance. I guess this is looking at this particular booklet here. Um, that number, and you so noted in the notes that the Nashville area, not necessarily right. Franklin, but is Franklin in those Nashville numbers? Because it's right almost Which 15%. Which page? Of, um, uh, page 30. Mm -hmm. 30. Yeah, yeah. I think that. 
So it, I guess my question is, I mean, it's vital signs telling us that we have a lot of kids in this region without health insurance. Someone is looking at this? Oh yeah, I, I'll let Amanda uh, answer the, specific, the specifics of the research. Uh, but again, you know, Williamson County has characteristics that are distinct to Williamson County and different from from other Man. counties. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we'd have to look a little, little bit deeper to give you the specifics on that one. Mm -hmm. Are you asking if Frank... But as a region, uh, the Nashville oh. numbers, when I look at this, it does not have Williamson County. It has just Nashville. Yeah, so these the are region. MSAs. That's and the MSA. Franklin yeah. is included in the so MSA. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Just a high number. Okay. To foreshadow a presentation that will happen not tonight, but soon. Think about what they just said and remember the term road miles. I'm going to remember it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, go ahead. This will be the last question I, and we'll wrap this up. I just want to throw this out. I'm sure you probably heard that uh, Governor, Governor Lee's first initiative. Uh, his first legislative initiative is the program give which is going to be the dual access to career and technology for dual enrollment uh, with public private partnership for our high schools so um, we talked about jobs um, Tennessee is going to be addressing that which is good it's his first initiative so that is going to be hopefully changing in the years <coughs> to come uh, to gear people towards that, those gifts, and th those, those jobs uh, that are coming uh, from our artificial intelligence and the technology. There are more school systems now looking at job certifications, what's called stackable mm -hmm. uh, credentials. Yep. Um, you know, the, the governor's uh, intent on this is something that we're strongly supportive of and we'll work closely with them on. Thank Amanda so and Ralph, we appreciate your Thank coming. You. And, Thank you. Uh, Remember, call us if you want to know more <laughs> and specifics about Franklin. Thank we appreciate that. You. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Oh, uh, could you take those two books? Do you mind and push them around? We both uh, sure. all the many. I, I need one as well. We, for sure. Okay. Oh, yeah, we need. If a few you want extras, uh, well, sure. we didn't have any. Oh, Margaret and I, oh. and Brandy, all three of us Fancy need a book. Okay, we're going to keep moving along, and we have a uh, pass that around, please. Uh, consideration resolution 2019-05, a resolution approving the Midnight Sun public art installation. Can I hand that down, Brandy, please? Uh, oh yeah, we're tonight from our, uh, our, our both our uh, public arts commission and uh, representatives from the Convention and Visitors Bureau. We have. <laughs> one is wearing both hats. So I'm not sure which one she's wearing I'm tonight to talk about it. This evening. Okay. Hat. Yeah. So it's a good thing the vice chair <laughs> of Gary's the commission here is here. That's right. Yes. So the they want to talk to you about an exciting initiative. So please. Yes. Well, good evening, Mayor Moore and Alderman. Thank you for having us. Um, my name is Megan Weisinger, and I am here representing Visit Franklin and am going to talk to you a little bit about the uh, Midnight Sun scavenger hunt. So just to give you a little bit more um, context um, to the idea of this project and a little more insight into the vision and the mission of this, um, as a Convention and Visitors Bureau here in, in Franklin, and we always like to make sure that we're looking at uh, the changing face of the visitor, who the visitor is, um, what they're interested in, and we want to make sure that we're responding to that. So what we found over the last few years is that the face of our visitor is changing. We're, we're realizing that the visitor is skewing younger and younger. We're seeing a lot more younger families with young children. So we wanna make sure that we're offering, an offering opportunities for them to engage in our community in a fun, family-friendly kind of way and also involving their young children. And we also want to continue to make sure sure that we're engaging the residents as well and offering something that will be fun and educational for the residents as well. And then we also know that one of the main drivers to this area is our Great American Main Street. But we want to make sure that we're encouraging our visitors as well as our residents to explore all of the areas of our downtown historic district because there's so much history contained 
outside of downtown Main Street. So Clifford. Um, in addition to all of those wonderful things, um, this project, we're confident, will expand downtown Franklin's public art offering. Um, it will also encourage visitors and residents to explore the city of Franklin, including Main Street and also beyond. And uh, we know that it will also enhance not only the visitor experience, but the resident experience as well. And really kind of in a fun, family-friendly way. <coughs> so <laughs> when we initially started thinking about Thank you about this Vanna. project. Good, good <laughs> She's my Vanna. Good when we initially you started talking about this project, we wanted to make sure that the symbol made sense for Franklin. We wanted to make sure it was representative of something unique to Franklin. So we talked a lot about um, the history of Franklin. Um, we talked a lot about music. We thought about maybe a guitar or a guitar pick or something, but we realized that was kind of a thing for Nashville. Well, what we really found was truly unique to Franklin was the horse. There is so much equestrian history here, and we, we kept coming back to this idea of the horse, so we decided to move ahead with this horse that you see here. Um, we also believe that it pays, <laughs> it pays homage to all of the equestrian history, and additionally, when we um, came, came up with this idea, um, we we were throwing around a couple of different names and we kept coming back to Midnight Sun. And so we um, contacted the Harlan family and they were so excited about it and they gave us their blessing to name this the Midnight Sun Scavenger Hunt. And so um, once we determined the name and the symbol, we needed to find an artist that would help us create an amazing sculpted horse and she's sitting to my right tonight. Mm -hmm. We found Janelle Meyer, who um, is not only a local resident, but she is passionate about this town. She is passionate about horses and owns a few, I think, <laughs> right? Um, and she sculpts horses. And so to marry all that together, th she was just the perfect person um, to work with on this project. So, as we thought about a lot of the different sites that we wanted these bronze horse statues to be located on, we really gave careful consideration to each of these sites. So as you see through this, uh, look through this list, um, you'll notice that all of these sites have some kind of historical significance in shaping the history of downtown Franklin. These are a mix of um, both private and public sites, and we were very, um, uh, we made, we made certain that we checked with all of the owners of the private properties to get permission from them to put these horse statues on the properties. And we also worked with um, the Parks Department to make sure that we had approval for them to place this horse on, one of these horses on um, Harlan's Dale Farm. And we also um, took this project to um, many of the city departments to make sure that the locations of the horses were not only ADA compliant, but that they also adhered to a lot of the uh, pedestri pedestrian safety uh, regulations as well. And as far as installation and maintenance goes, Visit Franklin is taking on full responsibility to oversee the installation of these horse statues on all of the privately owned sites. Um, this will exclude the, Har the site at Harlansdale Farm, which the Parks Department has agreed to oversee installation of, as well as ongoing maintenance. Uh, the ongoing maintenance of all of the other horses at the private sites will be the responsibility of Visit Franklin. And so just to talk about a couple of the supplemental, supplemental materials that we will have for this project, um, no scavenger hunt is complete without a brochure, so we will make sure to have a brochure for this scavenger hunt that lists out all of the clues. And we will also make a prize pack of buttons that will say, I completed the Midnight Sun scavenger hunt or I solved the Midnight Sun scavenger hunt. Um, it will be a four pack of buttons because if there's children involved, we want to make sure that they don't just get one prize. We want to make sure that everybody gets one. 
And then we also have created a web page on the Visit Franklin website so that if anyone is interested in learning more about the scavenger hunt, they can go online and read a little bit more about it and also find out where to pick up the brochures. And as far as funding goes, we are really excited to say that we have completed our funding goal. And we, <laughs> sorry, um, and we also hope to launch um, this project in conjunction with the beginning of tourism season. So a launch date, we're looking at a launch date of March 2019. So I'm happy to take any questions that anyone might have. I will say to you that this comes uh, with a positive recommendation from FPAC and also from Historic Zoning. Cute little horse. <laughs> Isn't he adorable? Yeah. Well, she did a great a job. Tour yeah. it yeah. <laughs> we would love that. Each other's clues so you can take it and see if you can find yeah. them all. We may need the answers too. So <laughs> <laughs> the slide's they're pretty they're valuable. Tell me where they're going. I think this helps. That'll be a good test. <laughs> yeah. What is the size of these? That's the size. That's. That's, yep. That's the actual size. So yeah. where will they be at all these places? The secret, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> That's what makes it interesting. <laughs> You're familiar with a scavenger hunt, right? <laughs> 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 they have scavenger hunt day. Okay. They won't be true pants. It'll be okay. Well, we're excited about the work yeah. of the uh, art commission, and uh, we're excited for tourism starting. And, uh, uh, this is an exciting thing. So we look forward to more reports and more exciting things. So thanks for coming tonight. Thank you. That's an audience clap. That's good. Yeah. yeah. That doesn't always happen in this room. So uh, just a little housekeeping here. Uh, I'm going to move item number 16 in between 8 and 9 because uh, we have some people here who want to speak and we want to make sure they get them. So we're going to go on now to discussion of the Fuller Story Initiative. Um, so, we have some folks coming up to speak about this. As we discussed at our last work session, um, we wanted to provide you with some more specific uh, options or visuals to consider. Uh, worked with this uh, group to, to further define that. Here, some of the discussion we had uh, last time around, and also try to bring that all together in one one uh, package for you to, to respond to and to, and to discuss, and I'll let the team take it away from there. Uh, well, good evening. It's uh, good to see everybody again. And um, uh, Pastor Hewitt is not with us tonight. He has been uh, uh, under the weather with some health issues, so I know he'd appreciate uh, your prayers. And uh, before we get started also, I just want to thank everybody for showing up. Um, this is uh, the second time we've been able to uh, get uh, the community out in, uh, in support of what we're doing tonight. Um, in just a few seconds, uh, Eric is going to share uh, where we think um, or where we're proposing that the markers would go, but I have a, uh, something I want to read, and the reason I, I want to read it is so I don't get emotional. All right. And I wrote this, but it's really from all of us. Um, for the four of us, this started 18 months ago over a cup of coffee. It continued as we met with uh, Mayor Moore, uh, City Administrator Eric Stuckey, uh, several times over several months. And then throughout the following year, we met with historical societies, historical commissions, college professors, local historians, state historians, church pastors, and the business community. We drank a lot of coffee. <laughs> we have done our best to do our due diligence and to seek input and support from the community. Uh, in August, uh, we twice uh, came before this board uh, we did so again in September, and then uh, one more time in January, and, uh, and now tonight. Uh, this evening, we want to share with you where we think the markers and statues should go uh, to adequately, adequately tell the fuller story. We have prayed about uh, what we're going to share tonight. We even called the community to prayer uh, over this proposal uh, this past weekend. And so this past Sunday evening, each of you were mentioned by name in prayer by a group of your constituents. We also want you to know uh, that we have listened to you. Uh, we have heard what you have said. We've tried to answer your questions. Uh, we've strived to be open-minded. Uh, we respect your opinions and your leadership positions in our city. 
And so then as you shall see, we have made some changes uh, based on your input. We believe our proposal that we're going to present tonight is an appropriate compromise and a win-win for all involved, including the United Daughters of the Confederacy. We recognize that no amount of markers uh, can completely tell our city's rich history. Our purpose has never been to tell a complete story, just a fuller story, emphasizing the role African Americans played in shaping the tapestry <clears throat> that is Franklin, Tennessee. All we're asking for, and all we've ever asked for, is equal representation and a place of equal nobility. In 1899, during the unveiling of the downtown monument, the local newspaper interviewed the United Daughters of the Confederacy. They said that there was much discussion on where to place the monument. Some thought it would be best if it were in the battlefield, or at Carter House, or at Carton Plantation. They said they decided on the middle of the square because they wanted it to be in a public space where it could be used to educate future generations. We believe the UDC was right. We agree the downtown square is the perfect public space to tell the fuller story and educate future generations. We believe the ground in the middle of the square is sacred. However, it was made sacred long before November 30th, 1899. Some have referred to our country's embracement and practice of slavery as America's original sin. Decades before the monument was erected, where the monument now stands stood a courthouse and a market house. On that site, men, women, boys, and girls were sold like cattle into slavery. While we cannot right the wrongs of our past, we can reckon with them, learn from them, and honor those who endured such atrocities. It was their involuntary sacrifice that makes that ground holy ground. From the beginning, our stated goal has been to build up something instead of tearing something down. As pastors in this community, we want to be proactive and to do something positive and something that creates unity along racial lines. We believe the fuller story is a step in that direction. On a personal note, I believe to the very core of my being that the placement of these markers and the statue in the square both are both historically important and spiritually significant. What we are doing matters. The Fuller story is not a project for us. I've got plenty of projects. Mm -hmm. This is not a project. Rather, this is a calling. The Fuller story is not about us. It has never been about us. It's about people still to be born and what kind of city we desire to lead them. In the words of the prophet Jeremiah, seek the peace and prosperity of the city which I have carried you to. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Jeremiah 29, 7. And the fuller story is simply the right thing to do. You're on, you got it. <laughs> Before I get to that, I, I actually have written comments, so you know that I must have actually spent some time <laughs> thinking about what I'm going to say, which is kind of uncommon. <laughs> Usually it just kind of comes out. I was in Mobile recently, and of course, as folks like me do, I go to cemeteries. <laughs> And so I went to Magnolia Cemetery, and I found a Confederate monument in the heart of the Confederate section. 
It was erected in 1874, barely 10 years after the Civil War had ended. It reminded me a bit of Carnton. The first monuments and memorials to the Confederacy or to Confederate soldiers in particular were to honor the dead, and they were almost exclusively in cemeteries. Monuments like the one that we have in our square are different. They're from a different era. Memorialization went from places where the dead were actually buried to the public square and the public arena. In Williamson County in 1860, half of the residents were owned by someone else. In Tennessee in 1860, 25% of all families owned slaves. In America in 1860, 4 million people were owned by someone else. In America, between 1861 and 1865, some 700,000 soldiers died, perhaps as many as 100,000 civilians, because slavery had been tearing us apart since 1776. The history of our country and the path it has taken has been difficult. No one is suggesting that history should be erased. Rather, I believe the history embraced by the Fuller story is history that has not been widely told. The two elements of history that we're talking about, black and white, slave and confederate, north and south, coexisted in the same realm in the same time frame years ago. I see no reason why they cannot exist in the same place, in the same realm, in the same time frame in our own town square in 2019. I believe that because of the progress we have made since the turbulent years of the 1960s and the 1970s, we are closer than we have ever been to a more perfect union. I am an optimist at heart but not an idealist. I believe that instinctively, if sometimes terribly slowly, people move toward what is right and what is just. It's been 150 years since the Civil War ended. The small town that was once Franklin was once converged upon by two armies who proceeded to engage in one of the most violent battles of our long and terrible war. It's our war. It's our conflict. Before that day, men and women and children had been bought and sold in the square. Before that day, thousands of black Tennesseans escaped from slavery, and they came to Franklin. They came here, looking for freedom. Some became United States soldiers. They fought to defend the very country we hold up proudly today, one that's been a shining beacon of hope across an often troubled globe. After the war, a riot unfolded in the square, which was a reminder that simmering tensions remained, and they would for years. Anybody who remembers the 1960s knows it wasn't over after the Civil War ended. For a decade after the war, during the period we know as Reconstruction, people who'd been freed by our war sought their chance at the American dream. They sought their place at the American table. 35 years after the Battle of Franklin, the Confederate monument was erected to honor the dead and those who'd sacrificed for what they believed was right. We believe that in Franklin, in our square, in our most public of places, we can be honest about what happened before the war, what happened during it, and how it was remembered. History is not always comfortable. But the reality for those who earned their place in history was often far worse than uncomfortable. We have listened. We have talked. We have drank gallons of coffee. Coffee, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> there was an interesting conversation that occurred the last time Kevin and Chris were here, which unfortunately I, I couldn't attend, and it was about a military component in the circle but it's a place for the military. Um, it got me to thinking about a marker for the Battle of Franklin, which considering that's the realm I operate in, I'd never really considered such a marker. And maybe it is a military area, so to speak, but it's not just that. When the Battle of Franklin was raging, there was no courthouse. It had been torn down, the one that stood there originally. The square was empty. There was no monument. It was an empty square. Both armies passed through that square. The US Army that night as it went to Nashville. 
the battered Confederate Army limping behind the next day. Both armies came back through that same square two weeks later after the Battle of Nashville. I think that history should be told. I think you were right. As well as, of course, the monument, which has its own history. But the one marker that really needs to be there above all is the marker which denotes the location of the courthouse and the market house. Mm -hmm. Kevin's right. That ground was historic before the Civil War and long before the monument came there. It was made historic because of what we did to one another, what human beings did to one another. We can't change it. I can't even apologize for it, but I can admit what happened. And if you traveled around this city, you'd find little idea that it ever happened. Let's be honest and just say that it happened on that spot. And the argument that placing a marker where history happened, it's true. It's always best placed where it happened. And it happened right there. So what we'd like you to do is take a look at these drawings, which I know a number of you had asked. So we propose placing two markers in the circle in the middle of the square. One, a rather generic marker to the Battle of Franklin, a text of which can be determined later on, but a marker also to the courthouse and the slave market, which I think you have in your packet. Although these two markers aren't, we initially were drawing up four, but we've gone to two in the circle. So the marker on the left is one of the two places we propose. The one on the right, which faces down toward the river, we would propose swinging that around to face Main Street. So there are four steps, in, uh, three sets of steps in a ramp that leads up to the monument. We're proposing uh, the two in the circle. Of course, we've talked about the statue to a United States colored soldier. So before I get to that, let's look at this particular um, look at the monument. So this is with City Hall behind us. That's Third mm -hmm. Avenue yeah. South, right? That you're looking. Yeah, you're, you're looking at the monument. So yes, yeah, City Third Hall Avenue would be South behind us, Main Street behind. to the <coughs> left. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, our proposal is a marker here, and then another one on the Main Street side, not as it was depicted in the other, which is on the Main Street toward which the river East side. Main. Yes, yes, sir. <coughs> this is an aerial view. The courthouse in this image would be on the lower left, the existing historic courthouse. So you can see the markers really as we are truly proposing them, leaving the ramp and the side leading toward the river open. This is based upon the USCT statue that is in the National Cemetery at Madison <coughs> in the USCT section. This is an area that's currently occupied by what's known as the Civil, Way, Civil War Trails Gateway Marker. It basically establishes for visitors where historic sites are in town. It really doesn't tell them anything about history. The Civil War Trails Program is agreeable to move that marker to the Carter House because really it depicts places on the battlefield. Statue could go in this location, flanked. We propose by two markers. One, the USCT marker itself, which would tell you who this man depicts, and the, the reconstruction marker. So you could have one on one side, one on the other. Orientation of you know, how they line up can be determined by people far smarter than I am. The last marker, which we don't really have a slide for, would be to the right of this, closer to Mellow Mushroom. That would be where the riot marker, our proposal is to place it because the riot came down 3rd Avenue, basically right in front of where we are right now, and spilled into the square and then into that corner where the, um, uh, where Mellow Mushroom is, where John House uh, had a store. So we believe the, the placement of these three markers, one to this soldier, this United States soldier, and the strides made by African Americans during that 10 year period known as Reconstruction would be incredibly powerful, not just to us, but to posterity. The riot, it happened. Just like riots happened in many cities across the country after the war. And you know, all communities have a little bit of history that 
they've grappled with it time to time, and this is one of them. It's related to this fuller story, but the other two in the circle. I, I'll end by saying, I think what I said when we first talked to you back in September, and I know I, I know I said at the beginning, some of you have been through this battlefield reclamation project with those of us at Franklin's Charge and the Battle for Income Trust for almost 15 years. We promised then that we would tell the whole story. This is part of the whole story. And the truth is a lot of folks won't go to the battlefield. They won't go to Carnton or Carter House. They won't go to Fort Granger or Winstead Hill. But they're downtown. And if they learn something while they're here, not just about what happened here, but how this community embraced its entire history, white, black, Confederate, US, North and South, the whole thing, the big ugly mess that it was, and just said, here's where it happened. On this site, here's what happened on this date, here's what these people did, here's what these people did. Knowledge is always good. Understanding the past, I think, is always good. Thank you. Uh, Alderman McClendon, I'm going to recognize you in just one second, but I want to kind of set the groundwork here. We still have a lot to go. I'm going to allow up to 15 minutes for discussion on this, and I do have two public comments, so I'll recognize Alderman McClendon. <coughs> I was, uh, I, the first time I came to this room was 1995. I came back after that until I was elected in 97, and I've been on the board since. Uh, this is by far the most profound opportunity that I've had serving this community as an alderman. It's not even close. Um, I have supported in 21 years every single battlefield reclamation project that's come before the board. Um, and I um, adamantly supported this project when you first came in. Um, going so far as to spontaneously ask for an executive session so that we could clear the way uh, by filing a, a lawsuit that unfortunately is necessary to permit placement of these markers, if we see fit, in, in the square. When we were here last, I articulated a, a preference or a, an inclination to limit what we might put in the square to those things that had to do directly with the battle and the monument that was placed. And I was wrong to suggest that that was the appropriate def or delineation. Um, and I'm ashamed to admit that I allowed a preference for clear and bright, knowable rules to, uh, I allowed myself to exalt that over something far more profound. And it should have been obvious to me. And as I, struggle and think through things that come before us, I always look for something that I can rest easy on. And it is important that the board articulate um, rules that are uh, rational and that are knowable and that, that lead to predictable results when the same type of thing is, is brought before the board in the future. And so the idea that we would limit anything that might go in the square, in the circle, to things that were directly related to the battlefield, to the battle, or to the monument, had the virtue of being a bright line and easily knowable. But that is not what is most important here, because it is clear to me that the single most important thing that ever happened in the square was the purchase and sale of human beings uh, for decades leading up to the war. And um, so I will support the project that you have presented tonight. Um, and I will be profoundly disappointed if this board does not see fit to place the uh, slave market marker in the square um, because it happened there and it is true. The other markers, I think, are important and I think are also appropriately placed. And I will support your request as you have presented it. Alderman Martin. Brad Perry and I probably have more family members that fought in the Battle of Franklin than anybody in this room. It's very personal to me. 
uh, I was asked by my second graders if I was here during the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> and I had never thought, never really thought about it. I grew up on the battlefield, but I never really, I just didn't make that connection. I will support this. I will support the, uh, the placement. Um, the war is over, but we need to, we need to make amends. I, since I had family who fought in the Civil War, I will not, I, I'm sorry about it. I will not accept responsibility or guilt for it, but if there's any way that I can help atone for what my family went through or was responsible for, then I certainly will support this. And I thank you for your presentations. Thank Alderman you. Alderman Blanton, then I've got Alderman Barnhill. Um, wow. Um, I have not really wavered in my support. I hope that you understand that. I do know that we asked for a schematic, which you brought. Um, I had a conversation last night with um, someone who's not in this room that suggested a different, you know, way to do things. And, and I was shared with them after our meeting and, and before tonight, I was, I had the opportunity to drive up East Main and get that vantage point of the square and look really carefully in my head of what a schematic would look like with these particular signs that we've been using in other areas. And, and I'm not trying to upset the apple cart. I think it's great that you came back and you're trying to balance this for everyone. I, I'm fine with all four of them being on the square. And I'm not trying to cause problem, but um, I, I, I look out in this room and, and I appreciate the support of the community and I appreciate the community that you, that's being built within our community where people are feeling like they have value and sitting in these chairs and being recognized. And I look at, and I'm calling you out, Dee Dee Derricks, but I'm looking at Dee Dee Derricks over there who I went to high school with and it breaks my heart to know that the same town I grew up in was not the same town she grew up in. And that was never my intention. And, and I don't think I have blame for that, but um, it hurts my heart because I, I think even for Dee Dee, who's 50 years old like me, and again, I apologize I'm bringing you into this conversation, Dee Dee. Um, you just told everybody how it's for I'm 50. <laughs> She's, she, you get me, don't you, girl? It, it's important. And... So I, I'm proud to be sitting on this board at this time and to be able to try to fix some things that should have been fixed a long time ago. So. Alderman Barnhill, then I'll recognize Alderman Branchford. Okay. I, I don't think I need to say anything. But I Alderman Branchford, I've taken you off the time. No, 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 I will. I do. <laughs> I make no secret that we met a couple of days ago and we looked at this and I was uh, in agreement with this particular proposal. I do think that the, uh, that the slave market was facing East Main rather than Main Street itself, but uh, that's, that's the location itself is probably within the parameters of where you believe the slave market was. And I suspect it was all the way around the square, anywhere down through there. I don't have a particular problem with this. I, I, do, <coughs> I, do want to, I do want to bring up one little thing. If this is if this is it, why do we need the lawsuit? I mean, I mean, I'm just asking. If 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 you think because the the UDC claims that they own the entire square and that we don't have the right to do any of this. Well, let, let me let me make a suggestion to you or to anyone else. We might meet with the UDC and suggest to them that they have the area that they pro is probably most prominent to them. That concrete sidewalk there has relatively little sig significance other than the opportunity for you to display the story and before you interrupt the steps going up to that monument. You know, I've, I've been opposed to the lawsuit from day one. I haven't made any secret of that. I don't think it really solves anything if you find a judge that makes a decision one way or the other and part of the community is in agreement and part of the community is not in agreement. So I would suggest that there's probably somebody from the UDC that would be willing to meet with the city administrator and we probably can draw up something that pulls out the sidewalk from any question as to who owns that. And if we, if the grassed area up there and the bermed area is part of the UDC's, 
property or whatever, uh, I'm fine with that. I don't have any problem with those with the monuments there. I think that they're appropriate. I certainly don't have one for the for the statue that's over in front of the uh, the now courthouse and whatever you whatever's put around that to make sure that everybody understands what the story is. So I'm, I don't, that may be something that I mean. <laughs> I mean, Kevin, you even said, I think you said the other night, I believe that just as kind of a afterthought, why do we even need the lawsuit? And uh, I mean, I, that, I mean, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but I believe I remember something similar to that. And I just would ask that we look at, a, look at that opportunity. I think I, I'm going to support the location as to where they are. And that's for the... <laughs> doesn't matter what happens to the lawsuit, okay? I, I do want to say we have offered, these gentlemen have offered to meet. We have offered to meet as a city staff team with UDC members anytime. And with their attorney, we've made that offer repeatedly. Well, I, we will continue to do so. We are glad to have a discussion. Okay. I'm not sure that, well, th that's up to we've them. We've made that I, offer. I don't, we will the continue. The city has also made in writing an offer to, to do a deed to a thousand square feet more or less around underneath and and around the statue to the UDC and that offer has not even been responded to well that okay I, I don't I don't I'm not going to argue about I, what I'm interrupt you on the lawsuit you know we're, we're in the middle of the lawsuit yeah. and I think it's probably best that we not be discussing uh, the lawsuit and the merits or whatever of it so I'm gonna ask that discussion to stop uh, okay I, I think you've registered your uh, comment and uh, about that and we're certainly glad with your assistance to pursue that I've got Alderman Bransford I just just want to say a couple of things that I am uh, in agreement with everything all my colleagues who have spoken thus far I must say I'm so proud of them and I also want to say to the pastors prayer can change things okay I know that was you had a prayer meeting the other night and a lot of good people been praying about folks um, making a heartfelt decision and as of now what I've heard is very positive from my colleagues and I'm looking forward to um, I'm like you I, I, I would love to sit down with the daughters and I think it's time for us to be in the same room I want the daughters of the Confederates to sit down with Pearl Bransford and let's talk this let's talk I want to hear your story and I'm gonna tell you my story Okay, I've got two public comments, uh, and I'm, I'm going to give them one minute apiece. I've got David Browd, and I've got uh, Paxton Terry. So uh, just you can come to the podium, podium up there, David, and then Paxton. Okay, great. One minute apiece, please. When's the timer start? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just want to thank... Um, the aldermans and mr mayor for this being something important enough to take the time uh to talk through and especially um kevin and chris and the other pastors hewitt sawyers and uh even back denny dense i've known all of them for a long time and really respect um their perspective and i'm here kind of on behalf i i guess as part of the majority culture i can't pretend to understand that i know the perspective of a lot of folks um but I do know um, I have two children that are biracial, and I know their comfort level um, with the city and with the way they feel um, could be greatly enhanced and improved and um, feel their dignity much more restored with projects like this. Um, not that it is a project, Kevin, because you said it's not a project, but um, initiatives like this. Um, and I guess lastly, I just want to say um, that I love the city of Franklin. I know you all love the city of Franklin. And I think that um, <clears throat> that we don't want to uh, put Southern heritage or Southern tradition over the dignity of humans. And so that would be um, kind of my, my perspective is that we love the city too much to do that. Thank you. Paxton, one minute. Uh, hi, I'm Paxton Perry. Um, my family goes back about as far as anyone's here. Um, so that being said, my family's done as bad as anyone's family has done to anyone 
in the whole United States and especially here in Franklin. And I can't say sorry. I would like to apologize on their behalf, even though I know they weren't sorry. But I've grown up with people who went to a different school, went, lived in a different city, and experienced just a different life than I did. And on behalf of them and me and everyone who I went to school with at New Hope Academy right here in Franklin, I'd just like to say that this project, sorry, not a project, <laughs> would make me and all of them extremely proud to call Franklin our home. And it just shows something, <coughs> it just shows a tremendous step forward that we needed to take for a long time. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to uh, items five, six, seven, which are um, compliance certificates for wine and grocery stores for uh, three MAPCO stores. Any question about those? If not, we'll move on to item number eight, which is uh, consideration resolution 2018-102, a resolution providing design direction for State Route 96 West multi-purpose tr multi trail project Vera Valley Drive to Fifth Avenue North. Um, so you want to give us a, a high view of that and what options have been discussed since the last meeting and uh, then we do have uh, a few public comments and board input. So we walked through this uh, issue with you at our last meeting. We wanted to refine for you what we perceive as the options at this point. Um, and I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll touch on them at a high level and let uh, Paul or Vernon color in uh, anything else we need to in terms of those details. But um, as we look at this, um, one, uh, the, the suggestion or option that I think we would recommend from a staff perspective having reviewed this is that we provide a uh, driveway access, curb cut access, uh, one or two, whatever will work best to allow access to that property and allow parking uh, to be developed on the private property that is there. One of the suggestions that was made um, by one of the um, family members of the owner was was to look at the paved area that exists now as a parking option. We think that could work to help that happen there. Uh, you might need to reconfigure some of the outdoor canopy space, uh, but, but that might be an option to allow parking to happen on their private property in front of their retail location. Um, and, and that could be uh, easily implemented as part of the project. Uh, the other options that, that uh, are available to us one, um, the property owner themselves has offered uh, to sell the property to us um, and, and made a specific offer related to that. Uh, and then the other is one we talked about, which would be the development of some kind of public parking space, call it a trailhead in that, in that general vicinity. We'd again need to provide a curb cut to get to it. Uh, we, however, estimate that would cost us somewhere north of $700,000 to develop, and you're probably only going to get a very low number of parking spaces out of that, maybe five or six spaces. Uh, with that value proposition there, I, I, I don't believe that is a uh, one I would recommend just given that cost. Uh, but those are the three options we think are before you today uh, as we look at this, uh, and we've put a lot of time into trying to think through other ways to do this and spent time uh, with the property owner and her family members to try to think through what this could look like. And those are really, when you distill it all down, the, the three options uh, that are before us. Um, I don't think any of them are, are exactly perfect, but uh, again, I think the one we suggested was provide the access through the trail with a driveway access and, and, and allow them to work with the property they, the property they own and, and the paving that may already be there to provide um, some parking for their customers. Um, Paul, Vernon, is there anything you want to add? To um, well, first of all, good evening. Thank, thank you, Eric. Yeah, Eric uh, laid it out well. I will recognize uh, Ms. Williams, her mother, who I haven't had the opportunity to meet, and her brother, are, are here if, if you have some questions for them. We did meet with them following our, our last meeting. 
talk through through this some more, but still landed on uh, the recommendation of providing them one or two driveway entrances from the public right of way to their property line as they would um, as they would like. Um, we did talk, and we um, I talked to Ms. Williams. She's uh, made arrangements to open um, uh, her business and stock it uh, for the, the spring. And we wouldn't touch, um, have any intention of touching her property anytime before June 1st. So she was able to place some orders and uh, at least serve her customers in the springtime. But um, we're looking for direction from yourself. And Paul, I don't know if you have anything else to add. No, I think I'm very general. Yeah, we've provided several different options for configurations, but. I've got Alderman Blanton in that wants to make a comment, and I do have uh, three comments, and uh, it's from uh, Ms. Williams and uh, Ms. Rittenberry and Harry Reed. So, uh, whenever when after the now. board, I'm by the way. I mean, why don't we hear from you? Right, well, you go ahead, and then I'll well, while they're coming. I wasn't up, here the last time we talked about this, and I apologize. Um, and I, I don't know if Miss Ann remembers. I'm not trying to throw you under the bus with me, but. Um, when we first started talking about this trail or sidewalk or whatever we're calling it before TDOT got involved, I, I made the, um, I noticed that both BB's Barbecue and Miss Rittenberry's would be affected by doing the 10 foot trail or any type of wider situation. And I think we both, okay, so you are with me. We brought both brought that up in the beginning and I understand that you know, TDOT got into the middle of it. We were able to do a much bigger project, and it's very beneficial to everyone. But I, I just want to say from the very beginning, I did not want to affect those two small businesses. With Miss Rittenberry, I can remember when they were down by the river before Betty Reed built her place. Um, so I want to see if their intent is to remain there. Um, I want to do everything I can to support that, and I think that we. Um, yes, ma'am. <laughs> I think that we need to do what we, it's very much like Columbia Avenue. Mm -hmm. And that's what, what I'm going to give you as an analogy. When we consider the small businesses that were here way before we became the it place, these people have made their living here on our community and for progress to push them out with no other place to go. To me, it's wrong. And, it, and it's the same thing like Ames Crab. It's the same thing with Moody's and Harpeth True Value, when we start pushing our longtime businesses out for progress, then we need to look at ourselves in the mirror. So I'm only going to support what keeps them in business in the way they've been accustomed to. Anybody else want to make a comment on the board? If not, I uh, want to yeah, hear from them and see where uh, it's so, uh, <coughs> Ms. Rittenberry, I believe you're the senior member of this group. I'm going to allow you two minutes, followed by. Uh, Gail Williams, followed by Mr. Reed, if that's okay. We're going to let you talk. <laughs> no, this, but I've been doing this for 40 years here in Franklin, and we like being there, but the place where we're at, if they take part of it for parking, we don't have the room, you know, to have the things that we need because we need a little more room than we've got for trees and uh, bushes and things, you know, for the landscapers. We could do a bigger business, but it will ruin us if we have to put parking inside the, build, inside the building. We just need a bigger place than what we've got, really. I mean, we're happy with what we've got, but if they do part of it for parking, it will ruin us. Ms. Williams? know what else to say I mean we tried to you know come up with solutions and okay um I, like I was saying we tried to come up with solutions and um we really don't know what to do um we want to stay in business and like mama said we've done it all our life and you know my my kids and my grandkids want to do it as well but we're just like y'all trying to come up with a solution. 
Mr. Reed. Okay, I don't know if I can say everything I need to in two minutes, but I'll do my well, best. I'll allow a little liberty minutes. since You've everybody else is a little time. Time. Yeah. We'll give you some of their time. <laughs> There's been some things stated on this property that are not true. Um, the tables are one of them uh, that's on this property. They have to have the tables in order to display their uh, fruit and vegetables and flowers. That <clears throat> these tables were approved by the code department here. So was the fence that's put up. Uh, T dot also came down one time <clears throat> about the parking people parking out there. We discussed it with him because the little V section there that the attorney owns, he has sent a letter that if at one time to my sister, if somebody parked in front of his property, he was going to have it towed. T. Dot said, let them tow it and you'll own the property. Uh, they, they give us permission to use that road to park. So they've done what they were supposed to do here. Uh, my mother still works here at this fruit stand six, six days a week mm -hmm. from open to close. That, that's their livelihood. It supports three families. Uh, when we have to move these tables and try to make a parking place, there will not really be a business there. As far as the parking, <coughs> if the city purchases this land and we give a price on it, which I think is very fair price for a business and acre of land, um, but if you go down there and look, you're saying there's not room for four or five parking places. That is not true. Where the building's at, if it were taken down, I went down there this afternoon before we come here. It'd be easy to put in at least on the land that's built up, that's sitting right there right now, at least 20 parking places or more. It's wide enough. It's over 100 foot in one direction and 100 foot the other way. Also, you'd have areas down below it that you could even put a picnic area if, if need be. But there's room for at least, if any of you would come down, I'd be glad to show you. But there's a room for at least 20 parking places easy there where that building is sitting and all the room beside it that it's already at street level. I, I want to clarify, when we talk about five, six spaces, we're talking about allowing your business to main, Ms. Williams' business to maintain, stay. to stay and to put parking adjacent to it. So we, we weren't talking about the whole area, we are talking about what we could provide that would provide parking for the, for the business, like that diagram shows mm -hmm. there. Uh, and that's what we, from looking at it and looking at the topography that we thought could fit in that, that little section of ground there. You'd have to do a condemnation. You'd have to do a condemnation to do that, to, to get to that. Um, part of the property then would, uh, belongs to, to um, Ms. Williams. Okay, well I misunderstood. I, I just wanted to clarify that. that. Okay. So, um, so it's right there. But what it's gonna do is when they have to, have to shut the tables down mm -hmm. to try to park mm -hmm. four or five cars there, it's going to ruin their business. I mean, it's, there's no other way to look at it. Okay. Uh, we have some opportunity for the board to make some comments. Alderman yeah, Bransford, then Alderman Martin. Yeah, I think I just, I just need to be clear and hear clearly from you all is selling the property to this, you know, condemnation or whatever we need to do, is that, is that an option for you all to, to? She said, is that an option for us to sell the property? What did she say for that? She said it would be best for us to establish out of business, correct? To s would. Yeah, right, I'm gonna say, I would, we need to know if that is something that- Best for you to could, what? Could, could. Just sell. Clarify yeah. that, please. It's best for you to sell if you don't get the parking or if or just right out. I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand. That. Right, and that's what I was trying you? to get at because if, if you're going to have a limited parking or only own half of it, part of it, 
and, and it may impact your business, mm -hmm. would you rather just go ahead and sell? I, I'm not putting words in your mouth. I'm just, I just need to know where, well, you, where I, are you thinking? Yes, ma'am. I discussed it with both of them. Uh, and they said once this uh, trail, or whatever it be, goes through, it will destroy their business. So they'd be better off selling it True. than trying to do away with uh, patch it mm -hmm. and put a parking lot there in the front mm -hmm. that really <coughs> nobody could get in and out of. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's what I needed to hear from you all. Okay. I think Mr. Girth wanted to make a clarification. Yeah, because as Ms. Williams had mentioned, we've, <coughs> we've met many times and had very um, good discussions. It's a, it's a challenging situation. But th when we l met last, um, they did come and, and with a figure to, to purchase their property um, that they would no longer you know, operate their business there. I do want to be clear that the multi-use path doesn't encroach onto their property whatsoever. What it does do, it takes away the parking that's existed in, in the existing right of, of, mm -hmm. of way because we're going to install curb and, and gutter and lineage there. So um, I just want to make that clarification. But we did, have we talked many options, that was one of the last options that we discussed here in the last week. You yield to Alderman Mark. Yes, yes, please. I just have a yes, no question. Is there room behind the business to put the trail to let it wind behind the business and then come out? It's down by the floodplain. I don't know that I'm prepared to answer that question right now. I will say, based on the grand time frame, it is too late to more. It's too late to design it that way and still meet the deadline. Hmm. Uh, the deadline that we have is to be able to have this ready for construction by uh, July of this year. And so we would not have time to go back. We would, we would lose that grant. I can take it. Alderman <laughs> McClendon. So this is, it's, it's difficult to balance the, the equities here yeah. and get the right, th get the right result. Um, as a, as a legal matter, if we are not taking any of their property to do this project, Ms. Billingsley, might this nonetheless trigger an inverse condemnation claim if we're not taking any of their property yeah. per se? Would a would a would they would they potentially have an inverse condemnation claim as a result of the project? Well, I'll research that for you. Okay. That's true. I understand that. I mean, the, 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 it is clear to me that the the business has operated and depended upon yeah. parking mm -hmm. on property that they didn't own. I get it. It's also clear to me that the project that we're talking about doing now does not take any of their property. But oh. if so you take away. if doing the project as designed would would create a viable inverse condemnation claim, then I could definitely see my way to making a, a fair price. And I don't know the number that they've quoted, and I don't know if it's fair. But that kind of, it's not that it only matters if they have a viable claim, but it matters more. Because as a, as a fiduciary of the taxpayer's money, I, I have to be able to justify buying someone out if that's what we're going to do in order to buy someone in order to justify buying someone out they have to have a they have to it would be better if they had a viable claim to resolve if they don't then it's 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 another quandary huh. um, so if we could know the answer to that and if the landowners the business owners have a number in mind that could be substantiated through our condemnation process, then that may be the best of some number of bad solutions. I'll give you an answer before, before you go with Okay. Um, if, that's, if they do not have that, then I don't know what I'll do. Um, I, would, I would 
I mean, I don't want to displace the business at all, but I, um, I, I, don't, I don't really know what the best of the bad solutions is. Okay, Alderman Berger. Uh, Shauna, what did you say? When would we have an answer to that? We'll make sure you have that answer before right, you are right. asked to vote yeah. on anything. Yeah, because I, I, I don't want to displace the business either, but I, I agree with what Dana says here that we need to take a look at that. Okay, well, we're going to move on unless there's one. Thank you. Alderman Barnhill. Yeah. Here's what I think possibly we may need to have to come back. Mm -hmm. so, and it can back in the work session. Mm -hmm. I think we need to know what they're asking for the property and what this work that particular amount mm -hmm. and however we want to do that if we want to make that a trailhead park mm -hmm. or whatever and the business goes away and you've got 20 parking places in there that works for that mm -hmm. so I think it's two or three issues I think you need to know I need, I need to know what they're at what they number mm -hmm. they gave mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. not tonight right but you, you need that. to you need to massage that number yeah. and be comfortable with it when you present it back to us mm -hmm. That that's a number that that uh, you think that possibly we would uh, we would live with, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd go from there. I, I'm having uh, I'm having some difficulty understanding because I drove by and looked. It appears to me that there's enough room on the end on on the I guess the west side of it to have some parking places in this woods grown up, and I can't tell whether that little triangular area, how close it is to the business itself <coughs> in relation to who owns it. But it does appear as if there's room in the area for some parking. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I think what we're depicting is where, where you, what you could put in there, and that's our best estimate yeah. about oh. how much parking, given the topography that you could put in. I think stay with the one you had before. That one? The no, one, that one. That one is really probably the... <coughs> Well, okay. I will also say too, because it goes down pretty. It's pretty steep okay. back there. Mm -hmm. the, the parking there is is. I don't know when you sort of transient, but it turns over. Yeah, it's quick. People yeah. don't come and hang out. They come and they buy and they go. That's right. That's right. So there's not going to be a lot of long right. stays. So five mm -hmm. parking places. Four five would. It's kind of probably work. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I know people stack up down 96 and they park whichever yeah. way. But it turns over pretty quick. Yeah, the five parking places will do away with all their tables if they. Table. I see what you're saying here. Okay. Well, if we if we do this, your tables could stay. Yeah. Because that is west of where the existing canopy mm -hmm. and tables are. The, the west. Yeah. The yeah. This option would allow you to preserve that. But you can't do the west because that little triangle. We'd have to condemn that property. We'd have to, condemn that We'd property. Have to take no. some other actions. Yeah. Uh, in order for us to get in, that. If, if that could be done. Oh look, we're getting somewhere. Well, that, that's the that's the one we described. Yeah. It's okay. about a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar option. Yeah. And what kind of grain are we getting from T dot? You're getting about a million eight. Well, what okay. you're getting the million eight, but what you're getting is the is the Increase in the walk walkability that sure. we're looking for, and the trail system that mm -hmm. we're looking for, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and what we're and what the parks department comes to us every two weeks and tells us that here's another trail system, here's another park system. That's what you're getting. It's mm -hmm. okay. Well, we're right. going to move on. We've still got a lot of things to cover, and we're going to go to item 16, which is a resolution 2019-01, a resolution directing staff to proceed with the flood insurance rate mapping association with raw. Ralston Branch. This is an item that was before the Capital Investment Committee uh, in January, and uh, they reviewed it, but did ask that we bring it to uh, the full board for some review and discussion, just so that there's an understanding of uh, what we're talking about. There's there's additional information that the city staff has obtained as we've reviewed this area and reviewed this stream and I'll have Paul kind of walk through the basics of it and I know we have a few folks who want to speak to it as well in the audience and, and we'll take you through this issue. Uh, so this project dates back to 2015 uh, is when the board approved the initial uh, scope of services with this. 
uh, this project, one of the main reasons this project was initiated was uh, there was one property in particular that had a significant loss along their bank, along the bank of Ralston Branch in their backyard. And so we went out and looked at it and we said, yeah, this, this needs a much bigger CIP project to try to address some of these erosion problems that we're seeing here. Our street department had done some repairs out there. Some of them were very successful. Others had failed. And that's what really led us to here. So before we went in and just did a stabilization project, we said, let's take a step back and see, is there anything we can do from, from a flood reduction standpoint to help with uh, these problems out here? And so that really kicked off a study of which we analyzed multiple different options of what could be done uh, with the lake located right there on Liberty, at Liberty Hill subdivision. And so we looked at options such as, uh, you know, modifying the outlet structure to putting in a dry dam to totally draining the lake in building it even deeper and as deep as we possibly could feasibly make it to see what options are out there. And, and we kept challenging our consultant, find us a flood reduction method. We want to know what it takes to do it. Paul, I want to just reiterate that that lake for everybody to make sure they know is the Liberty Hills Lake that fronts Liberty that you're talking about. Yes, okay. from so Liberty Pike, thank you. Make sure. thank you. And so we looked at every option there was, and none of them had a major impact on that critical 100-year storm event. They had impacts on the, the lower storm events, but not that 100-year storm event. And, and so we, we, at that point, realized there weren't many good options to do flood reduction and focus back in on trying to fix the erosion problem. And so I wanna walk you through some of these slides up here. The first slide shows the, the current FEMA flood map. Um, what's here in blue is Ralston Creek, and, and what's right here is the limits of the study. The floodplain doesn't magically stop there. That's just the limits of the study. It, it's always extended up along this blue line. It's just never been mapped or studied. Can you also show that on that map for the people to see? So you kind of see this is the limits of the study. But this floodplain always existed up through here to some degree. It just was never finalized through FEMA. And so one of the steps that we had to take while doing uh, these flood reduction studies that we did was first we had to understand and map uh, the existing floodplain limits. And that's what this exhibit shows. Uh, we went back and forth with our consultant a few times. Ultimately, we, we ended up, our building and neighborhood services department put together an amazing spreadsheet of uh, properties that were impacted during the 2010 uh, flood event. And so we use that a lot of times to kind of compare that to what our model is showing to see how how accurate it seems to be, how close it seems to be, just to kind of check it, check it a little bit. And, and what you see here is every one of these properties in red are labeled with uh, the impacts. <coughs> some had impacts to their crawl space. Some had impacts to their, their first floor uh, living space a foot of water up into their living space. And so it, this, this exhibit really does line up with what the model actually is showing us. Uh, the other thing we did is we asked our consultant, part of the study was to survey the lowest adjacent grade of the houses and also the finished floor of the structures. Uh, we were happy to, to, to understand that all of the finished floor elevations of these structures are above that floodplain limit. Uh, and so what that means is uh, depending on the lenders that are out there, they can always look to get a some type of uh, uh, certif elevation certificate as it relates to floodplains. And so uh, what, what we're looking for direction on and, and engineering is recommending is that we proceed with the flood mapping of this basin based on uh, the study that has been completed. There's a few reasons why we'd, we'd recommend proceeding with the flood mapping of it. Uh, you know, one, mapping the floodplain creates that broad-based awareness throughout the community to residents, to emergency personnel of where that floodplain truly is for engineers, for planners, and building officials. Uh, the other reason is we're part of the uh, uh, FEMA's uh, community rating system, which is a voluntary incentive program uh, that communities participate in across the nation. And the reason why we participate in it is it, it helps prepare our community better but it also helps to reduce the insurance premiums that are charged to those uh, residents that live in those areas. Uh, and, and the last reason is ultimately, this is the latest information that we have based on our ordinances and our requirements. We have to regulate based off of this information anyways at this point. Uh, and so it's something that we would incorporate into our GIS mapping and start to 
regulate as if it's flood floodplain. And so the last the last effort is to try to uh, take this through FEMA and actually get the flood mapping completed. Um, we are still looking at moving forward uh, with an erosion stabilization project where we can stabilize some of the banks. Uh, that project is not funded by the board, so until it receives uh, funding as a capital project, it will uh, basically remain in a shovel-ready state. Uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Again, what we're asking tonight is your approval to proceed with the flood mapping of, of this section of Ralston Branch. Alderman Berger. I think, Paul, just let's clear, be clear on this. Um, so the elevation certificate uh, would show that the structure of the homes are not in the floodplain, but some, and that would not require them to have flood insurance, but then some lenders may require yeah. that. Ultimately, on it depends lender. on the lender. But yes. yes, it's one way to try to get out of having to pay flood insurance if you if, if you're you not didn't want the yes. flood insurance, you wouldn't have to take it unless your lender required it of you. Correct. Okay. Th does that mean the current home, or would it be if they sold it? If they sold if it. If they as well. sold it. So the certificate would allow them to be um, <coughs> without the flood insurance if they so chose. But then if they sold it, it would depend on the lender. Okay. The other thing is, I want to be clear about that. Um, so what is the advantage of us uh, going, f just reiterate again, the advantage for us to go forward with the mapping for the advantage for the city, the advantage for the residents? Uh, Broad-based awareness, in my opinion, is the most important reason to do it so that emergency personnel uh, are familiar with it. They know it's in the floodplain so that engineers, planners, building officials, uh, as, we do, as we look at additions onto buildings, as we look at structures, that that's all very well known. We also had the community rating system of which we participate in. Uh, and one way to score better and higher in that system is to map these areas that are unmapped. Uh, and what that does ultimately is helps our rating and reduces insurance premiums okay. across the city. All right. All right. Um, Alderman Martin. I feel like I'm beating a dead dog, but <laughs> all right. So the awareness, I understand, that's for the homeowner and everybody. I mm -hmm. yeah. The flood insurance, though, that could mean that they have to get flood insurance or they do not have to get flood insurance. Uh, that'd be up to their lender in the individual situation, I imagine. Okay, but there's still no way to eliminate the flooding. Correct. We still don't have that. We have it. totally exhausted that. We looked at 11 different options. Uh, none of them had an impact on those bigger storm events. We were able to find solutions that helped with the smaller two-year, five-year, 10-year return type storm events, but nothing that would impact those larger okay. storm events. All right, so, because we have some residents here in this room tonight yeah. that are in this position. So they don't have to get, if this thing is mapped, they don't have to get flood insurance unless they sell and the new lender mm -hmm. requires it. Well, it's up to their, exist Wait, I was gonna yeah, say the existing, their existing lender, lender. That's still. Up, yeah. Their existing lender. Could also yeah. have. Could. So we don't could know. Could not. Okay. We don't know. So we don't know. Mm -hmm. okay. Just ask a question along depends, those lines yeah. and I've got something to say later. But the question is how much would they have to pay to get themselves out of the floodplain if it is mapped, even though you're saying that the, that the structures are above the floodplain level. But if you want to get yourself so that the flood insurance is not required of you, then you have to pay a certain amount to have what done. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the exact answer to what it would cost. I know to do an elevation certificate is just simply hiring a surveyor to come out there and perform it and then submit that paperwork on your behalf to FEMA. And so how much have you heard? You, I, I mean, it could be a thousand dollars about. And then there's no, there's no uh, assurance that they'll be removed from the floodplain. Even well, then. Well, they were not, they yeah, they're not gonna be removed from the floodplain ever, but that, that could get them out of flood insurance, having to pay for flood insurance. Because the they've they documented so their elevation. 
the yard is in the floodplain. I understand you know, that. Not the home. Mm -hmm. Did you want to finish up on a comment? Because oh. I want to get the uh, citizens sure. to speak, and we've still got a lot of things to go through. Sure. So uh, make your comment if you would. Okay. Uh, Peterson. The question that I asked at the meeting was, who benefits from this? And, and, and you have said, well, the city, perhaps because they can get some extra information in. Uh, but I also asked the question, generally, the problem has been on the property, not on the structure. That's, that's where the, the, the erosion and everything, that's where the difficulty is coming. If you have flood insurance, would flood insurance pay for doing something about erosion to the property and not the stu structure? No, it would not. So my, my, my real question is, who is going to benefit from having this done? Well, the, the knowledge of knowing that your house is in the floodplain, some of these properties that did get damage in their crawl space into their house, had they had the opportunity to have flood insurance, they may have benefited from it. Having that knowledge, mm -hmm. but they have knowledge when the flood, when the water gets in there, they have knowledge. It's too late to buy the insurance. Yeah. 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 But the then insurance. they can get it. If it's already been in the house, yeah, they know it's there. And if they don't get it, till, I mean, it, it's it's difficult to ignore the information and the knowledge that we have. That's the the difficulty here. It's hard to make a case that it's a huge benefit to anyone except That's for right. we have better knowledge about the extent of our floodplain. Yep. And that is a that is a responsibility we have to share information. So I mean that's it's a difficult topic and a difficult issue, but we're trying to be as clear about it as we can be and share the information we've obtained. And and I guess we can say uh, people owners can buy flood insurance whether they are designated in the floodplain or not. I don't know that answer. Oh, yes. That, yeah, that is. But, but is it cost more? If you're designated in the floodplain, mm -hmm. is there any benefit uh, for cost, do you think? I mean, I've lived in floodplain twice, so I had flood insurance. Um, but if I wasn't, if it wasn't mapped, it wasn't, then I wonder if it would cost them more or if it's designated. It gives you any, I have no idea. I'm not sure about that. Our, our uh, participation in this program does help folks get obtain discounts on the insurance mm -hmm. they So how much buy. discount are we talking about? 1%, um, 20%? No, it's around, it's a 10% or more right now, I think. I'd, do you guys know? I think 15%. 15% oh, right now. Really? The higher, the better rating we have, the more that discount increases. So, so that is one of it would also and, and be that applies to everybody across the it community. It would also be interesting to find out how much flood insurance would cost per year for this. Well, you've raised a lot of questions, and yes, we don't have that, all the answers that's, that's yet. Exactly I want to get uh, Mr. Eiton <coughs> and Mr. Davis up, and uh, we're going to give them two minutes apiece, and we may need to bring this issue back again, and we'll see. Uh, so... Mr. Eiton, you're welcome to sit with us. Okay. Okay. The city really decided to make this a floodplain. It was not always a floodplain. I've lived here for 26 years. When I moved here, um, You come back to the microphone because we're okay. Um, so, you drained all of the subdivisions north of Liberty Pike when you rebuilt Liberty Pike, in addition to Liberty Pike, and you drained it all right down into Ralston Creek, into a pipe that's uh, three by six at its smallest end. It's larger up under Liberty Pike. You put drains in Liberty Pike every 15 feet that not only have just one grate like you normally see, but three. Uh, this is confirmed by your 
floodplain map, when it starts, the colored one that we were shown in the presentation back in November, right where the color starts is exactly where your pipe comes out into the creek. Uh, that is a blue line creek and you modified the banks and the basin of the creek when you put that pipe in. You put rocks there knowing that it was going to forcefully have water there. Um, so what's being voted on tonight is whether to forcibly put it in a FEMA floodplain. It seemed like there was some confusion back in December when we sent out a letter and some of the councilmen we talked to then. This is not a, a forced thing at all. It's because you spent three years on a study to put it in a FEMA floodplain map, which is just absurd to me because you created the floodplain that you're trying to put in a map. Mm. To me, I thought you were for three years trying to find a solution when evidently that was never the case. Um, and I really don't understand why the city would do an inverse condemnation to put me in a floodplain and have me pay not only the flood insurance, but if I ever try and sell a house, it's devalued the house probably twenty dollars to $30,000 because nobody wants to buy a house in a floodplain mm -hmm. and pay the flood insurance every year that is somewhere between two dollars and $4,000 a year. So if you'll wind I, up, your, your time's up. Mr. Right. So I, I'll leave it with, I don't know who benefits either. Mr. Davis. Hey, uh, my wife and I moved here in 1980, and we've lived at 313 Sheffield for 39 years. <laughs> proud to be a Franklinite <laughs> and proud to be able to talk to you folks tonight. Thank you for listening. Uh, going out on my property yesterday, I wanted to just take a visual of what's really happened over these years. When we moved here, we had 70 trees on this half acre lot, just, just a beautiful, beautiful place. Right now, the creek at flood stage at my house at the bridge is 17 feet wide. When that creek reaches almost flood stage, it is at four and a half feet and it is not sitting still. It is very dangerous. Should a child or, or even a strong man or woman fall into that creek, they are going to be in real serious trouble. I appreciate talking with you about this. I heard you say a while ago that at that greater flood we had several years ago, that nothing could be done to impact that type of situation, but we have flooding at a lot less, lot less rainfall than that. I have pictures with me now back in December where the water was four and a half feet deep. It has been out of the bank several times. I have lost four trees already. We're talking about wanting to be a tree city. Mm -hmm. I have lost four trees. I have 10 trees right now that are at different points of root exposure. What are we going to do? Mm -hmm. I have lost four feet of property, a bank. And, and what the flood has done, it has actually laid my bank back on one side and cut it straight down on the other. I have large trees in danger right now. We need even a lesser solution. I would, I would like to talk about submersible pumps again and shutting that thing off and regulating some of the flow to where we can keep some kind of a level flow in that creek mm -hmm. rather than when a three or four inch rain comes that we are just taking it all on. I, no, I'm not an engineer and I appreciate what you guys are trying to do, but please work with us on this. I've, I've worked with flood insurance before and I know one thing, I pay the first $5,000 of any damage any damage after I pay those flood insurance policies. And so it covers no bridge, it covers no trees, it covers nothing basically in my yard. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm just asking for your help 
to reconsider, you know, the more moderate types of things we get into. I mean, you know, it's not only dangerous, it is destroying my property, you know. I appreciate, I appreciate mm -hmm. the opportunity to talk to you about it, and then I would appreciate yep. further talk about this. I just need to understand. I'm a simple man, and I can't understand why submergible pumps that cost two to three thousand dollars a piece and will pump two or three hundred gallons a minute cannot keep that reservoir at some kind of a non-flood level. Mm -hmm. And when the rain comes, to keep pumping it out and keep pumping it out. So I just I don't understand it, and I would appreciate. I you know I'm I'm reasonable in that if I can understand it. I'm okay with it, but something's got to be done to help us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your we comments. Could we uh, question Paul yeah. a couple we, more minutes? Oh, absolutely. Oh, we're sure. going to have to. Paul, what, what, you mentioned some of the other options, and I think, Paul, you said you've looked at 11 different options on this right here that don't solve the flooding issue. I'm I'm. I'm I'm a little bit lost as to why you don't, if I understood right, even if you're in the floodplain, you don't have to take the flood insurance. Is that? Your lender. That's your lender requirement. Yeah. It's on your relationship well, with your well, lender. Well, you can shop the lender, okay? I mean, I, I you know. You want to change the lender. Well. Some people don't. If, if, if you're in the I need to understand how and why this it makes it such that somebody has to go out and take flood insurance on something now that they haven't had, that they haven't had flood insurance on for the last 39 years or whatever. Can you tell me why that? Do you understand what I'm saying? It might <coughs> be, please. Well, well, let, me, well, let, me, let me ask a different question. What if we just drop this all together? Uh, we would. We would just regulate based off what we have from yeah. a city standpoint. Yeah. So what happens? We do any work? Take FEMA out of it. Can we? Can go we, ahead, all Can all we right. still? Can we still look, do work? Let me let me say this. Well, let me say one more thing. If you've got a house that floods and you don't declare it when you sold <coughs> that house, then there's an issue there with the realtor and the future owner yep. going into that. So it's not a matter of just dropping this and suddenly saying that the house doesn't flood and and, and whatever, uh, and and the, what, where are the submergible pumps? Are they in the lake pumping all the time, lowering that level to accept some flood? There are no submersible pumps today. Well, but I mean yeah. that, that's what he's proposing. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. We look at it, and that's what that would do. Yeah, but that doesn't work. No, it does not work for the larger storm events. Okay. Help in the small ones. All right. Sound like a small one. Sound like For the large. Well, what? I, I, that's because I think if I can get to Alderman Barnhill's question. So uh, several years ago, as you know, we became part of FEMA's community rating system. And with that, we're obligated to follow the criteria <laughs> in managing the floodplain. Okay. If it, and part of that, one of the most basic criteria is that any time we're given new information, that we must follow that. And as Paul has mentioned through our consultant, this property um, qualifies for, for being in the, in the flood. This flood. area. And we must, we mu are obligated to follow that. If we don't, when we're audited, we'll either be reduced in our rating, where we've just stepped up a couple points, or we won't be able to participate in it, which means the, the discounts that are available to property owners with property in the floodplain would go away. So, question. So, so in other words, if we don't do the mapping, that could be citywide hurting the people's yes. Uh, yes. rates. Yeah. The whole program. So, in other words, if they were paying five hundred dollars a year, they could be Didn't paying you say four thousand. Well, say you know, I paid two two fifty a year before, but that's been years ago. So I'm sure it's a thousand. But you know, say okay, say I'm paying a thousand dollars. So if that that affects that rate, I might pay twelve hundred, fifteen hundred, or something. Could what you're saying? That's across the board. Mm -hmm. 
right? If yes, we're if not, you're using an yes. illustrated example of the numbers, mapping. because we don't know what those right. are based on so the no, houses and their value like any So in other like words, we have this before us, and if we choose not to do the mapping, that can adversely affect us, yes. you're saying. And then, oh, yeah. Um, right. Yeah, and then the other thing is, uh, I think the submergible pumps that we were talking about, that Mr. Davis brought up, that um, the, the small rain events uh, or the, the large ones, like Paul, you said the large ones we wouldn't really take care of the large events, but we have so many rain events. <laughs> We've had a ton of rain events that haven't been large rain events, but constant rain events, day after day, week after week. And that's what Mr. Davis was telling me the other day. He said these constant rain events, not large ones, but constant, consistent rain events are impacting the backyards. So no matter what we do here as a board, there's gotta be some work done on that creek bed to help, help these residents stop the erosion. He's lost four feet of his. I know other people have lost as much. So somehow we've gotta figure out something to do to stop the erosion. And I would like to see us maybe go back to the drawing board. I don't know, if, Paul, that's even possible to figure out maybe the submergible pumps would help ease that um, impact on our normal rain events. And if that is the case, would that be an option? Yeah, we could bring that data back. We've already done a lot of that analysis. So we yeah. just need to, the report to never got that. finalized. That's why I didn't get a chance to send it out. But once that report's finalized, I can bring that back and we can do a presentation on it. And, and this, yeah. just to make sure everybody understands, there is a shovel ready bank stabilization project that there. is on our capital improvement right. list. Yes, sir. Yes. Which yes, is sir. separate money from this for this mapping. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. M Mr. Davis, what was that? I'm sorry. May uh, I ask? Mr. Mayor. The retaining pool has not been dredged in close to 10, ten years. years. Yes, you're correct. Yeah. The, uh, that okay. Liberty Pike. Well, I'm going to ask that we uh, do a little more study and maybe bring this back again no. for some more uh, study com comments. Yeah. Item 9 is uh, contract 2018-277 with Thank Franklin you. Housing Authority for CDBG funds of about $126,000 to help them on Chickasaw mm -hmm. senior development. Everybody good with that This one? is consistent with what yes. you directed us to do yes. over the summer. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, may I say something? Uh, I just wanted to say the uh, people that are leaving here from that last item that we will be back in touch. Okay, thank you. Item 10 is a uh, contract with Community Housing Partners for Home Rehabilitation Assistance to Moderate Income Residents of Franklin. Everybody good with that? Then uh, item 11 is the um, rezoning of uh, property on Carruthers, South Carruthers for the Discovery Center, which is on the voting session tonight. And then the next two items are Lockwood Glen, uh, Redeve uh, revised development plan and rezoning because of this property. Um, so everybody good with that. Then we'll go to 14, which is an ordinance to amend Franklin Municipal Code, comprehensive fees and penalties uh, uh, relating to zoning and land use application fees for the planning review process. He, he, sit down no quick, problem. you won't get to sit down. No, 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 we were a lightning round, I think we might I, be. Yeah, I had a question on that. Um, I, I did have a question on that. I'm trying to find my notes. Um, this thing wasn't loading fast enough. But um, the, um, the zoning and land application fees, uh, the zoning, pro the, okay, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I, I just need to speak to this one thing. It's something about um, these projects. In other words, okay. So what happened to my notes? They all disappeared off of here. Okay, so in other words, you're saying that it's taking an average of 10.5 hours per staff member, okay? <coughs> and we have about 21 people in the design review team. That's all departments, I take it, mm -hmm. all departments. Yes. Okay, and so it's gone from uh, now we're paying on average, uh, it's costing the city $7,380 to review versus $4,180 uh, in 2010. Okay, so if we raise these rates, 
I, I just want to know one thing. If we have a project that comes through and the design and review team, it comes before them and it's one property and it's fairly simplified, and then you've got another project that comes in and it's much more complicated, how does that differ? So we're charging the simplified one the same price as the complicated one? That doesn't make sense to me. they have a per square footage and per dwelling unit fee that's added on top of it so the more complex projects are being charged a higher fee than the smaller scale projects now that doesn't work across the board sure there might be an infill project in downtown that is a small scale project and turns out to be extremely complicated but for the most part the large scale projects are being charged that larger fee because it's per square footage and per um, Per I, I just don't want the the smaller projects to be paying and making up the difference all the time and, and paying the same as the more complicated and to me that made no sense well and based I, on I didn't um, understand if you that, look at the um, there's a per square foot yeah I can, yeah. Yeah, I can go yeah. through yeah. them yeah. if you'd yeah. like yeah. but it's I mean but it is per square footage and per dwelling unit so the small scale projects will be paying a the base fee of a thousand dollars for a development plan five hundred dollars for a site plan and then a small increment on top of that whereas a large project is going to pay a very large increment on top of that base that right, base so rate it evens out you're mm -hmm. telling me we're okay all right to do what you were describing i just want to make sure yeah. okay <laughs> oh, uh, thank you. fyi we're going to go to 15 now which is road impact fee offset agreement for avalon square pud subdivision with parks development group i'll ask mr holzen to come up and go through all that and I do know the applicant is here and then we're going to do, do we're going to take items 17 and 18 to the next work session so Jack wherever you are yeah, sorry <laughs> all that and Michael Walker Michael. John sorry <laughs> but this has been entertaining <laughs> tonight for you so you didn't so go ahead Paul I try to be brief but this conversation admittedly may take a little bit of time sure um, so uh, we're excited to see the Avalon Square development project moving forward uh, as part of that we have agreed on uh, modifications to three different medians for a road impact fee offset agreement of around one hundred ninety six thousand dollars and that's what staff is recommending uh, now on top of those three median uh, modifications that uh, staff is in agreement on uh, the applicant, Mr. Parks, is requesting for additional offsets of which staff is recommending disapproval of. And I'm going to walk you through those as briefly as I can. Uh, most, of, most of what we're recommending disapproval on are essentially turn lanes and deacceleration lanes. Uh, those are primarily installed to serve the development. They do not serve the arterial roadway, and therefore we have historically not allowed road impact fees uh, to be used for deacceleration or acceleration lanes that serve the development. Now, in addition to that, there are two traffic signals that are being installed as part of this project. Uh, one at this Cool Springs Boulevard, where you see the number one up here. That's where one of the signals will be installed. The other one is down here. One of the signals 100% entirely serves their development. It is not part of the signal master plan. Therefore, we would recommend disapproval of that one. Uh, the other signal serves primarily their development, but there is Avalon across the street, and it does serve, I want to say it's around 80-some uh, houses that are over there. But again, the policy that we've adopted is that if it's on the signal master plan, we would utilize road impact fees to yeah. uh, pay for those signals. <coughs> if it's not on that signal master plan, it would be borne 100% by the developer, which is what led to our ultimate recommendation. Uh, Mr. Parks is here uh, to, to speak to that as well. So happy to answer any questions. I think you have a, a memo in your package uh, that outlines kind of where we're coming from. Uh, we're making the request that we add the uh, items that are listed as does not apply uh, to the road impact fee credit uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is technical. We believe that the desail lanes along this corridor uh, do have a large impact on the carrying capacity of the roads by moving traffic off of the main thoroughfare roads and the main lanes and getting them out of the way so that the traffic can continue to proceed, especially in this vital transportation corridor. 
Uh, the second, uh, in the traffic signals, I think it, it has two positive impacts. Uh, the first one Paul mentioned is that it provides uh, access for the, um, to the Avalon residential area, uh, which they already, uh, in sev several of our neighborhood meetings, were concerned about their access to Cool Springs Boulevard uh, and being able to get out. The second is those signals will provide metering, i.e. gaps in the traffic either from the Cool Springs Boulevard direction or the McEwen direction to allow entrance into the roundabout at various stages. So mm -hmm. it, it will create some gaps to allow the roundabout, in my opinion, to work better. Um, the other uh, situation that we have is basically financial. So to give you a little bit of background, uh, when the 2004 plan was approved that's currently, that we currently have, uh, the road impact fees were about $1.4 million. Uh, with the latest ordinance, uh, adding the collectors to it, uh, the road impact fees for that same project would now be $5 million, mm -hmm. a little over $5 million. Under our latest plan that you'll be voting first reading tonight, uh, the road <coughs> impact fees are anticipated to be about seven and three quarter million dollars. So essentially what's happening is the approximately $1.4 million that we're asking to be added to the road impact fee credit for the diesel lanes and the traffic signals. Uh, if we're required to pay for that, our total cost of road improvements uh, due to this project is about $9.2 million. Um, you'll not be surprised to find out that that's a very large sum of money for one project to, to handle. Uh, between the road impact fees, which is a big piece of it, uh, and the city and county fees, our total fees are about $16 million. So essentially what happens is the cost of those fees are the same thing as the cost of bricks and mortar, buildings, paving in our site, uh, any, any other appurtenance that we have that we're building in our development. And essentially what we have to do is all those fees will get passed on to either the tenants who are renting space here or to the residents who live here. And it's at, at some point in time, the fees just get so high that we can't raise the prices high enough so that, that tenants can afford to do business there or residents can afford to live there. So we're, we are at least trying to, to get the, uh, the ability to take the road impact fees on the traffic signals and the desale lanes. Um, I think we've designed a fantastic project. Frankly, it is, uh, it's very expensive to build. We have a lot of open space. We have a lot of community space, and, um, and it's going to be a well-run organization. I think um, the other thing to keep in mind is this will generate a significant amount of sales tax and real estate taxes for forever. So that's our request that you consider that. Alderman Berger. Uh, Ms. Parks, normally I, I'm not in favor of waiving most of these things, but we've got I've got some concerns here because um, the desal lanes are a given because we've got to move, as you said, I, I agree with what you're saying here because we've got to move that traffic off the main road. As they come in, we've got to make sure, in other words, uh, before I forget, Paul, I just make sure that these lanes are long enough that we're requiring them to do because I don't want it being able to stack two cars or three cars, we've got to stack four, five, and six cars to, to turn. Because um, this is going to be a major development in this area. And the other thing is uh, the moving in the traffic off the main road and also um, the um, signalization is so important because we've got, that's going to help our, we've been talking about this all the time, it's going to help our roundabout. We've got to have that and it's really important because our roundabout has to have that to, to cue those cards, cars in better into our roundabout. So those are really important to me and to the residents in that area. Uh, access to Avalon, of course, uh, the Avalon people wanted that. The uh, signal metering for the roundabout is the other thing, but also the fire station. That is also gonna help our fire station over there as well when that light has to be changed when they, they're leaving the fire station. Um, and the other thing that I'm really concerned about here, and as I said, I normally don't think waiving these fees is a good idea on most occasions, but you're putting in a lot of 
you're, you're putting in a top rate development over there, thank you. <laughs> but um, my concern, and I've heard this from my residents who I've talked to about this when I saw this on the agenda, we've, we've had some discussion. And some of the concern is if it gets too expensive over there, then you, you get, you, we don't wanna see a failed development. We can't afford to have failed development over there. We've got a big development sitting down on a corner. It's not a failed development, it's just waiting to be developed on that Carruthers and McEwen right now. I don't wanna see this rock pile from years and years to come. I want bulldozers in there, the neighbors want bulldozers in there. All those subdivisions, five, six subdivisions in that area, we wanna see your bulldozers in that area and get rid of our <coughs> rock pile over there and make that a really nice area. So my concern in the board, in the, uh, I'd like for the board to hear this is that if we get too expensive in this area and we had a failed fail development, um, that's not gonna help us. The other thing is, uh, I do agree, it does bring a lot of um, taxes and a lot of revenue to the city and to our, to our city from this development. Um, those were my comments to you and I, I have a tendency to agree with that, that part of it. And tonight we're considering a rezoning on the voting session and, and not offset agreement. Not, not, not the offset. Yeah, that's correct. Yes, right. it's okay. just a um, Well, I don't see any other comments. Uh, I'm gonna ask Mr. Stuckey, he had one more comment and then we will be back in here at and in It's not on this minutes. item, but it's, it relates to one of them that we deferred. I did wanna note, Nate Ridley, who sat through this, that was going to be part of that presentation. We recently promoted Nate yeah. to the assistant director for the Sanitation and Environmental Services Department. So. Stand up, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> Nate has been with us for some time. He's worked his way up in different responsibilities in the department, and we're just thrilled to have him take this next step and know he'll serve very, very well. So, great thank first, you, Nate. Great first experience, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Not Wait, yet. don't get hurt. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank uh, you. 15 minutes promptly. Thank you. Thank you, Senior. Thanks. We'll see where it goes.